deeper sense of connection. And then I noticed that um, Nixon was saying that uh, Timothy Leary was the most dangerous man in America. And I thought, what is Timothy Leary doing right? <laughs> that Nixon would say this. What is the threat? And the threat, I think, it, and, and this is, I think, key to what I'd like to say today, which is that um, at the time, the threat was that these people would be waking up and they wouldn't be going in the factories, they wouldn't be going to the war. And there was this um, sense that um, that this counterculture was being created. And I think that was the fundamental mistake of the 60s made by the advocates. Because when you define yourself as counterculture, you are in opposition to something usually that's way bigger than you and will be uh, eventually mobilized to squash you. And so now the whole effort that we're trying to do is to become mainstream, to become into the center, to go to, you know, I don't want to try to, there was a few, brilliant book by Aldous Huxley, who was you know, one of the first people interested in psychedelics uh, in this modern age, and it was called Island. And it was about um, trying to create this paradise on this island. And it was a very psychedelic culture. And in the middle of the, writing the book, he realized that he wanted to change what he was saying. And so he ended up with the, this island was destroyed by the gas, the oil companies. So there is no private utopia. There is no escape. There is no way to go that's safe with global warming, with nuclear weapons. There is no safety other than going into the heart of the system and trying to open it up from up there. So this is what I was sort of sensing at, at age 18. And I started seeing that this kind of um, work is being so suppressed with research with psychedelics. And this whole community um, has been so um, fought against that, that um, I thought as sort of a revolutionary strategy, or as an evolutionary strategy, is what I'd prefer to say. You know, that I, that I would, I had the luxury and the freedom and the responsibility to devote myself to some kind of peaceful strategy, and it seemed like bringing back psychedelics would be it. I felt like I needed psychedelic therapy. You know, I, I like so much what you said, Justin, about how even people that are happy and successful suffer an enormous amount. And when you think about how other people, how, how much more they must str struggle and suffer. So I felt like I needed my own therapy. Somehow or other, the world needed this. And so that became my purpose in life from age eight, from 18. And so I just turned 63 <laughs> on Wednesday. And I, I just feel so grateful that somehow or other, that 18-year-old had an idea that I still think is valid today. <laughs> and, and so what's been... My strategy is I, I basically identified as a counterculture drug using criminal. <laughs> and what I wanted to do was become a, um, not a criminal, not counterculture, but still keep with the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and so the heart of my life has been trying to become legit in that way. Um, and through that process, I ended up uh, sort of have two mentors. One was Stan Groff who's the world's leading LSD researcher. He's 85 or 86 right now. He developed holotropic breath work through hyperventilation. He's, um, and he spent 4,000 days sitting with people doing LSD in his career. He was an early researcher in the 1950s with LSD. He actually came to America only because the Russians came into Czech Republic, where he lived, Czechoslovakia, and, and he escaped here to freedom, and he became uh, the head of research at, at Johns Hopkins, the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center for LSD work, for a couple of years until that got squashed. Um, and then he developed, in a brilliant way, he, he found a way to work with hyperventilation, to, work, to keep true to psychedelics. A lot of the people in the 60s, um, when the crackdown happened, said, now we need to find non-drug alternatives. And there's a lot of wisdom in that, because really, it's not about the drug, it's about the experience that you have and then trying to integrate it. Um, there's a difference between a religious experience and a religious life. And that difference is integration and, and what you bring back. So it's not so much about the experience, but it's about how you integrate it into your life. And so he found a way to continue focusing on psychedelics, not to veer off, not necessarily to veer off, but to do work with meditation or yoga or, or type, all, all these different approaches that are crucial. But he was one of the few that stuck with trying to bring in non-ordinary states of consciousness. And he found a way through hyperventilation that he thought could never be made illegal. 
Uh, how are we going to criminalize breathing? <laughs> but he was wrong, actually. Um, in France, um, they have laws against cults. And they decided that holotropic breathwork was a cult. <laughs> and so France, for a while, criminalized holotropic breathwork. <laughs> but most of the places of the world it did happen. So Stan stuck, stuck with this. And I actually wrote him a letter in 1972 because it was his book, uh, Realms of the Human Unconscious, that I read um, when I went to my guidance counselor at college. And I said, I'm having all these problems with my LSD experiences. It was an era where that was acceptable conversation <laughs> with your guidance counselor. They didn't say, oh, you know, you're losing your student aid or your student room, or, you know, they got to It was more like, oh, that's, I'm very sympathetic. And the guidance counselor gave me this copy of The Realms of the Human Unconscious. And it was really reading that that crystallized everything for me. Because in that book, it was reporting on his LSD research. And what he was saying was that through science, through trying to filter out all the ways that we try to see what we want to see is true, that we try to see what actually is there. Through science, we can understand about the realms of the human unconscious. We can understand spirituality, not trapped by dogma of religions, but still sympathetic to the impulse that creates religion, the impulse of how we're just really part of this all whole, how we're all part of the same thing, us, nature, everything. That kind, And then there's different ways, just the way there's different languages, there's different religions to interpret the kind of so that's what he was saying, but it was through science to study consciousness and spirituality. But the thing that really did it for me was it was focused on psychotherapy. It was focused on healing. And this is actually, we had a discussion um, a little bit in New York about the difference between um, healing and knowledge. You know, there, there's the sense of um, what he was focused on was not just pure knowledge, trying to understand the brain, but it was like, putting it to practical use. And that became the reality test, is how do you use all of these states of consciousness to actually help people have a deeper enjoyment of life, or have the ability to move past trauma, or move past fear of death, or move past addiction. So I, I've had training ever since 1972 with Stan. Um, and then once I um, sort of went on a 16-year effort to try to work on my own tripping, to uh, get rag, dropped out of college for 10 years, and built myself up, built houses, got grounded, and then went back to school and started again with Stan in 82, learned about MDMA. Uh, and then I wanted to get a clinical psych PhD to understand psychotherapy outcomes. How, how do you actually do research to show that certain kinds of psychotherapies work, and then when you add psychedelics, they work even better? And then I thought through science, through healing, we can move through the sort of suppression of this, these things as identified with the counterculture. But I was unable to get into any graduate schools. This was in the late 80s, and psychedelic research was still squashed. And so I, I was blocked after this long track. And, and so I, I went home and I smoked some pot. And I, I found that you know, being blocked, uh, pot is great for me for sort of, how do I get out of this box? Mm -hmm. Seeing it, you know, what are all my underlying assumptions? And so I, I had this realization that um, the pattern that I have in my life is, you know, I want too much too soon. A bunch of girlfriends would tell me that. <laughs> but, but also, this, this was my pattern. And so I thought, here, I, I want too much. I, I want to do this psychedelic psychotherapy research, but the culture isn't ready for it, and it's being politically suppressed. So I thought, aha, then maybe I should study politics. Mm -hmm. So I had recalled, and, and I, I sort of skipped over, there was this part where I sued the DEA. <laughs> <laughs> this group of people that uh, was at Esalen, and we were trying to protect MDMA, therapeutic of MDMA. So that started from 84. Uh, 85 was the emergency scheduling, 86 we won the case, uh, but then the DEA rejected the recommendations, and we had to sue them in the appeals courts, and eventually we lost, and MDMA was consigned to schedule one. So, uh, so I had this sort of political aspect, even though I was studying psychology. And so I thought, okay, I gotta switch and study politics. And there was this fellow that had um, an interview in Harper's Magazine about drug policy, Mark Kleiman, and he had talked about the um, lawsuit. And so um, I, I called him up, he was at Harvard at the Kennedy School of Government. 
And so I said, would you be my mentor? I need to do this. And I have one college credit called suing the DEA. Nobody else in psychology. And so he ended up saying, if I could get in, he would be my mentor. So I managed to be the uh, affirmative action left-wing hippie of the year that into the Kennedy School. And, and so I have a master's and PhD from there. And so my, my work is sort of sick public policies mm. on the one hand and psychotherapy on the other. Mm. And, and that's what I've tried to, to integrate. And so what I, I recognize, though, back when MDMA was criminalized, is in our cultural context with this dominant system of prohibition that it seemed like one approach is religious freedom, and we have seen a lot of progress with ayahuasca. Um, and there has been kind of a, this general lack of interest on the police authorities to go after ayahuasca. It's, it's remarkable how far it's spread. Um, but there's only two religions, the uh, UDV and the Santo Daime, that are actually legally protected. And the problem is that they're religions, mm -hmm. and meaning they have a lot of things that you're questioning dogma, patriarch, hierarchical, homophobic, you know, so the, the lesson there is culture is more important than the psychedelics. The context is more, the psychedelics are tools, but they are used in certain cultural contexts. They can help you wake up to them, but the culture and the context is really what's crucial. So religious freedom, I felt, is an important argument, that this early argument that you made, your, your point number one. I mean, it's, it's totally true, but how do you persuade people of that? The other part is, um, if not religious freedom, you know, human rights. I mean, that argument is good and crucial, but that doesn't get you that far either, politically. I mean, it's growing. And, but it felt like, in our culture, medicine and healing, that was the way forward. Medicine, healing, and science. So MAPS was an organization I started in 1986, essentially as a nonprofit pharmaceutical company focused on developing psychedelics and marijuana into medicines. <clears throat> what, what I didn't realize at the time was that no drug had ever been made into a medicine by a nonprofit. <laughs> it's always been for profit. And that didn't change until 1999. And I don't think you'll be surprised when I tell you that the first drug that was ever made into a medicine by a nonprofit was the abortion pill, RU46. <laughs> because it was a controversial drug, no pharmaceutical company wanted to handle it, all their other products would be boycotted, but it was a combination of the Rockefellers, the Pritzkers, and the Buffets that supported that. And so I got this thought, okay, there, there can be private support for drug development. Now it's possible for nonprofits to make drugs into a medicine. And all I knew was that I didn't know this would ever work. I didn't know that this would ever succeed, but it always felt like this is what I needed to put my energy into. And so starting in 86, I started MAPS. It took us um, six years of uh, struggle with the FDA before they first let us do the safety study with MDMA. So we were able to do a um, brief safety study with 29 people, 28 people actually, and, um, and we got good results. And so the FDA had a, a change in 1992, and they said, we're going to put science over politics when it comes to research with psychedelics and marijuana. And this was some individual people for other reasons. They were under pressure for approving drugs more quickly. And so they created this new division inside the FDA to experiment with new approaches. They called it the pilot drug evaluation staff. And they needed drugs to actually work with. And so they looked around the FDA. And the FDA, it's like all these independent fiefdoms. For every body part, there's a group of people <laughs> who's evaluating drugs for that body part. And so they, they had to take drugs from different people, and different body parts from different people, <laughs> different divisions, and, and so they went to the people that were doing psychedelics and marijuana, who had squashed it for over 20 years, and they said, give us these drugs to review, and they said, sure, have them. And they got others, they got uh, aspirins, uh, they, they got uh, analgesic drugs, a few, a few different things, so they created this division, and they decided that they needed to, to uh, start letting stuff happen. Um, I had a presidential management fellowship, which I managed to get through the Kennedy School. So again, I'm trying to become a little bit more um, mainstream myself. Uh, the important thing to say here is that uh, Jimmy Carter, the first day in office, pardoned all the draft resistors. Mm -hmm. So that meant that I was no longer a criminal because of that. So that made it so now I could do all sorts of things, whereas before I couldn't. And so what we were able to really finally um, 
work on with the FDA. Uh, I, I tried to get a job at the FDA, and I almost did um, <laughs> through this Presidential Management Fellowship. The only part was that the DEA refused to work with me because I wanted to work in the branch of the FDA that deals with Schedule One drugs. So because of that, I ended up not getting hired. And I thought, great, I don't have to wear a suit and tie. I can still do drugs. And my, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, um, she managed to get a job um, doing inner city re revitalization for the city of Charlotte. So she became the man <laughs> working for the system. Mm -hmm. and, and I kept working on, on maps with people from the inside of the FDA saying that they would help informally to try to help, help us bring protocols to them. Because FDA is a reactive agency. They don't generate research, they review research by others. So we finally managed to complete the safety study in the end of the 90s. And then starting in, 1990, in starting in 2000, actually, I was approached by uh, Dr. Michael Midhofer, who was an expert psychiatrist. He was part of the breathwork community, trained by Stan. He'd been a member of MAPS for years, but I didn't know him. And he had had a friend, uh, a patient, actually, who was addicted to opiates. And the patient went down to St. Kitts to do Ibogaine in an Ibogaine clinic in St. Kitts. And Michael said the only condition is that he, he would let this patient do that, but he would go along. Um, so he went along and um, he saw this treatment and it was pretty helpful. So then Michael came to me at an ayahuasca conference actually in 2000 here in San Francisco. It was the first big conference on ayahuasca organized by Ralph Metzner. And what, uh, what he said was, let's do an offshore clinic for MDMA, for other psychedelics. And I said, I am absolutely not interested in that at all. Because it's not about finding some little safety out somewhere else. It's about going to the heart of the system. So I said, let's try to get permission for MDMA for PTSD. And he said, all right, he signed on for that. So from 2000 to uh, just a few weeks ago, um, we've been engaged in what's called phase two pilot research with psychedelics, with MDMA for PTSD. Um, and so we've had studies in Israel, studies in Switzerland, studies in the United States, studies in Canada. These are small pilot studies that you end up trying to um, understand how it works, who's your patient population, who's it for, what are your exclusion criteria, what are the doses, what are your measures, various things like that. So we kind of got all of that um, learning and we've appealed to the FDA in what's called an end of phase two meeting about the, the move to phase three. And phase three are the definitive studies that are used to prove safety and efficacy before you can make a drug into a medicine. It's, it's sort of the, it's like the big leagues. You know, you've got the pilot studies and then you move to the big leagues. So we had this meeting on the 29th, which I'll, I'll tell you about. I just want to also mention that we've done work on marijuana. Um, there was political suppression of marijuana research. So marijuana has been used by a lot of veterans and others for PTSD. So we have the first uh, marijuana study. Um, we've got uh, $2.1 million from the state of Colorado from all of their marijuana taxes. <laughs> um, and it's um, going to start at Johns Hopkins in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And marijuana for PTSD is good. It's a palliative treatment. Helps people not have nightmares. Helps focus them on the present. But it doesn't cure the problem. And people with PTSD, if they smoke marijuana, they tend to smoke it every day. It's a chronic drug that reduces symptoms. And when I described this to the FDA, when we had a teleconference to approve that study, I said our priority is MDMA because it offers the potential to cure. And what they said was, um, but but, MDMA, but marijuana is important. And the, the head of the FDA Division of Psychiatry Products, who's now our consultant, but what he said was, Rick, you don't need to apologize for just treating symptoms. He said in psychiatry, that's about all we do. <laughs> so we, we are working with Ibogaine. We've done observational studies with Ibogaine. We have um, projects with psychedelic harm reduction that we do at Burning Man and, and elsewhere at festivals around the world, trying to model a post-prohibition world. Because if we talk about how these drugs are for healing, but they're also, we need this broad-based spirituality so people don't demonize the other and don't fall victim to the fears of the people that you know, say we can't let in any Syrian refugees or we can't do anything like this. We, we need broad-based spirituality. Because the problem is not Trump. The problem is you know, the people that are voting for him. And you can't, it's not about the leader, it's about how is it that those messages can resonate with so many people. So that's why for me it's always been both doing research to make a drug into a medicine, but also working on trying to end prohibition. So that those of us that don't have a clinical diagnosis 
uh, last night a psychiatrist at my talk uh, who we're working with. He said it's easy to give a diagnosis. Hmm. You know, everybody you can have, but it's kind of you're fudging the system in a way. Yeah. So really, it has to go beyond medicine into legalization, and it has to do that in a way where we're being responsible. Because there's a lot of people at Burning Man and elsewhere that have difficult psychedelic trips and end up worse off than before. You know, if you don't have support, if stuff difficult comes up, and you try to suppress it, you could end up worse for weeks or months or years. It's about bringing things to the surface in a way where you can handle them, and then you can reorganize how you think about them. You can reorganize even brain circuits. We're doing research with fMRI scans of PTSD patients before and after treatment and showing reductions of activity in the fear centers of the brain and the amygdala. So it, there's a lot that's needs to be done both in medicine but also in, in the broader world and trying to help people at festivals to integrate what happens and then show that we can have these ceremonial recreational celebratory uses and we can do it in a safe way so this year burning man finally for the first time said we could let everybody know that we were there and we said we were doing psychedelic harm reduction we had 480 people during the course of the week come to zendo services we had hundreds of volunteers helping out so we're doing a lot of different things, but, <laughs> but the, the, the key thing, and through, I'll just say, through Bryce and through social media, and through all the communication that we're doing, you know, it's about the research, but it's really about communicating to the public what we're doing. And so our top priority is MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. We have a study with MDMA for autistic adults with social anxiety, a study with MDMA for people who have life-threatening illnesses, they're scared of dying. Um, we're working with the Veterans Administration therapists uh, for a couples therapy study where one member of the couple has PTSD and it affects the relationship. So through all of this though, for strategic reasons, MDMA is the most gentle of all the psychedelics. It's the, um, it's the most inherently therapeutic of all the psychedelics. Loads of people are telling us now they've read our treatment manual that describes our therapy on the website and they've gone and found MDMA on the, their own, and they've done it with friends, and now they feel better. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not trying to say it's always got to be done in these you know, supervised ways, that the people can heal themselves a lot, and sort of the, the, dem the democratization of psychedelic therapy. So the top priority, MDMA is the most gentle psychedelic. Um, people can tend not to have these ego dissolution experiences, so it's not as fearful, and also, we have to be treating people that are not like remnants from the 60s. This, these are not um, just for aging hippies. You know, we have to say, what is our current society? Who do they value? How can we show that this is of value to, when you talk about us and them, you know, this is of value to them? Who, who is really valued by our society? And right now, we have um, veterans tend to be, you know, even Trump is like, you know, he's all about helping veterans. And veterans have PTSD. There was, uh, and women, you know, women are you know, both denigrated and valued, and so a lot of people that, you know, childhood sexual abuse. And, and so we have a way in which we thought if we work with post-traumatic stress disorder, for which there's only Zoloft and Paxil, the only drugs approved by the FDA, they don't work that well at all. And there's 868,000 veterans receiving disability payments from the VA at a cost of about $17 billion a year. So we have almost a million veterans whose options, the available options for treatment were not successful. They still have PTSD to some degree. It's an enormous emotional suffering from war as well as this financial cost. So there is an incentive in our society to, to prioritize treatments for PTSD right now. So I felt for political reasons and because it is the most gentle and because it leads to love and compassion, but that would be the drug combination, the drug treatment, and the drug and condition combination. So on the 29th, we had this meeting with the FDA, and it's been widely reported, it's been in the, the New York Times, and, and we've had incredible luck to have uh, our lead doctor on Fox News for a five and a half minute segment um, on Thursday, leading off with the veterans. Um, there's a website called redstate.com, which is for a public and right-wing website. One of the veterans in our study wrote a story about how MDMA was helpful to him, and he had it published on redstate.com. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 and, and so I, I think we can generate bipartisan support for this. And at the FTA meeting, 
um, they, they said um, several different things. The, the, what they fundamentally said was that you have done enough research now with 107 patients with PTSD, you've learned enough about different doses, how you're doing it, that now you can go to phase three. This was probably... example for this was um, at Masada. I don't know if you know that Masada is um, a place in Israel. It's a mountaintop in Israel. And King Herod, who's the one that you know, was around and killed Jesus, he had these different castles um, set up through the Israel. And one of them was on top of Masada. And so the story there is that after the Romans uh, tried to finally crush the Jews and, and squash the, the, the temple, uh, this group of Jewish zealots ran away and they, they took over Masada. And it's, it's now, and they, they hold out for several years while the Roman legions came and they built these ramps way up to this mountain. It took them years and years of building these ramps. And right before they were able to cross and take over Masada, the people decided that they would commit suicide. And hundreds of people committed suicide rather than be conquered by the Romans. And a few people survived and they told the story. And this has become like a, one of the major tourist sites in Israel, one of the major sort of never again, as well as with the Holocaust, kind of a, a story, a theme. And so when we were there, um, there's a watchtower at the very top that's still left. And um, I was there, we had a conference in, uh, throughout Israel, but I was at the top of the watchtower. This is the middle of the Negev Desert, not far, you know, right near the Dead Sea. And so I just went up to the watchtower, and I just thought, I wonder if I get cell phone reception. Because <laughs> I didn't in that area. And it turns out there was. So I just did a work call from the top of Masada. An interview. And an interview, yeah, a media interview. And what, what I felt was that the zealots of the past were surrounded by the, the Roman legions. They could not escape, and they were all doomed. But we, the zealots of the present, have telecommunications. We have, we're, we're more interwoven in society. We're not so easily boxed in. And so I felt that there was this chance of survival, that, that we have the opportunities to fight back. And so I've always felt like, as long as I'm not in jails, I'm not, not in a concentration camp, that this fear drives me to do this work, but it, it drives me in being a hard worker rather than saying it's hopeless. So, it, it, you know, I, and I look back you know, it doesn't seem that long ago. I feel connected to kind of my 18-year-old self, and so I don't think 40 years, where did it all go? I mean, it's, it's like that. But at the same time, you know, it wasn't terrible uh, to, to do it. And I felt, I, I learned to be happy with the struggle, not with the outcome. Because there was so much blocking that if I had to be happy only because of the outcome, I'd be postponing my happiness for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> and then I would be drained. So in any case, what, what the FDA said at this meeting was, yes, we can go to phase three. The, what we, were, we have three different um, advisors who are helping us who all used to work at this branch of the FDA. And they've appreciated the fact that we're doing nonprofit drug development. So two out of the three are working for free for us. And the third, who was the head of it, is, is working as a job, but really cares about what we're doing. So we were advised to ask for what's called breakthrough therapy designation, which is um, S-ketamine. But ketamine is used for refractory depression right now. Mm -hmm. 
And so isomer ketamine was declared a breakthrough therapy. For, so we decided, okay, we're gonna ask for breakthrough therapy, and we're gonna ask to say it's a national emergency for PTSD, we should be only able to do one phase three study instead of the normal required two. And so we also said the fundamental methodological problem is how do you do a double blind study? Because <laughs> the FDA is supposed to approve drugs on the basis of two adequate and well-controlled studies, and they define adequate and well-controlled as randomized placebo controls double-blind studies. But how do you, I mean, any of you could tell if I gave you LSD or nothing. You know, you could tell it or not. And the same is true, so how do you do this double-blind study? So we, we, we got permission to go to phase three. There was a very fortuitous thing happening, which was right before the meeting uh, at the hotel, they had um, giving away USA Today. So I, I, I looked at the paper as we're heading off to the FDA offices. The front page of the USA Today, above the fold, with big picture, was about a veteran who committed suicide from PTSD. So I, I took that newspaper into the meeting, and that's how I opened the meeting. Mm. And I said, this is what's happening today. This is what's happening every day. This is why we're here. And that <coughs> kind of changed the tone of it. So what they said is that there, there is no solution to the double-blind problem. And so we suggested that we just compare the therapy with an inactive placebo with the full dose, the therapy with full dose MDMA. So they're gonna get back to us in 30 days about what they want us to use for the placebo condition. Mm -hmm. They're also gonna get that, we have a meeting on December 13th about this breakthrough therapy, whether they're gonna permit that or not. And they also <coughs> said that they're um, not sure, but possibly they would let us just do one large scale trial. But when you do that, you have to get a robust results. So, so what it means is if you have two studies and you get um, statistical significance, which is one in 20, it's, it's more than chance. It's, you know, chance of one in 20 is just random. If you can have that 0.05, that counts as statistically significant. But they said you had to get it where it's um, one in 1,000. Yeah. That's called robust, which we have done, actually, in some of our smaller phase two studies. But otherwise, we'd have to do two. So that that's... They're still thinking that over. But the main thing is that we can go forward to phase three. They are trying to work with us. They, are, they recognize the problems. And they were just um, very open to the collaborative nature of the discussion. They, they did ask one question that, that I thought was very important. They said, well, how is this going to be regulated in the future? Um, you know, once people are, once, if we approve this one day, you know, you're saying it's only MDMA assisted psychotherapy. It's not just MDMA. It's only given under supervision. We said, yes, that's exactly right. And they said, but will you require all the therapists to do MDMA themselves? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we have a program, actually, we got FDA permission. We said that therapists would be more effective if they've done MDMA. You don't go to a yoga teacher who doesn't do yoga. Yeah. <laughs> you don't go to a meditation teacher who's never meditated. You know, so we said that the therapist would be more effective if they've done MDMA. But into the FDA, and I've thought about this a lot, I said, absolutely not. We will, we, it, it's too cultish. It's not appropriate to force anybody to do a drug. There's got to be a free choice. So people could be therapists if they wanted to. As long as they knew about PTSD and they went through our training program, we could certify them. They, they definitely do not have to have done MDMA. However, you know, I personally wouldn't go to a therapist that had not done MDMA if they were giving me MDMA, but we would not require it. And I think that helped the FDA feel a lot more comfortable, that, that this, is, this is transparent, it's not cultish, and that there is some hope. And the last thing I'll say, and then we'll see if there's time for questions or so, is that um, not only are we trying to model something new, which is the combination of psychedelic and psychotherapy, but the other idea is um, how do we sell a drug in our society? And a lot of the concerns that have been expressed about legalizing marijuana are that you get big business involved in legalizing marijuana. And then they're gonna maximize their profits, they're gonna market to young people, they're gonna do all sorts of advertisements, you can't trust anything they'll say anymore because they're all out for the money. So how do you market a drug that does have abuse potential and what's an appropriate way to do that? So in California and in Delaware, there's a new form of capitalism called the Benefit Corporation. And there's several thousand benefit corporations. And what they are is a legal structure where you maximize social benefit rather than maximize profit. And so MAPS has created a 
bank or corporation that's wholly owned by the nonprofit. So there's no investors. People make donations to MAPS. We give the money to the, um, the benefit corporation. The benefit corporation does the research, and the benefit corporation will sell MDMA once it's in medicine, and that will be, we'll pay taxes. And the idea is that instead of us constantly asking people for money for donations, one day we're the rare nonprofit that has a product that we're trying to have TRM. And the actual service, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, it's almost entirely therapists' time working with people. So it, the, the expense of it is be for paying therapists. The cost of the drug is pretty trivial. So if it's $25 or $50 or $150 for the drug, it doesn't really matter that much to the, to the patients, particularly if we get it covered by insurance. So we've created this benefit corporation, and, and we hope that once we make MDMA into a medicine, we'll be able to generate income from the sale of MDMA that then we can put into more research. So that, that's kind of what I'm sharing, is that we, we have what looks to be a 25 to $30 million cost for phase three. Um, there's certain some we'll be refining that, but it definitely doesn't look more than that, and it could possibly be a little bit less than that. And of that, we already have about $11 million from bequests or from uh, Dr. Bronner's, uh, David Bronner from Bronner's Soaps, he's pledged a million a year for five years. So we, we have a good start. And the other thing is that we don't need it all right away because it's multiple years that it's gonna take us. We're currently on this trajectory of having MDMA approved by the FDA in 2021. So we've got another five years to go. Um, you know, we have a year-end campaign that's trying to raise um, the $400,000 to buy a legal kilogram of MDMA. Um, this, and a town threat. Yeah. And a town threat happening right now. Yeah, yeah. So uh, of that, we already raised 230000 so we're just trying to raise 170 And then we've already gotten, um, Justin did uh, a great, gave a $15,000 matching grant. <laughs> Week that was matched. We have a, another thirty thousand dollar matching grant that that's already been about half raised already within just a few days. And then just this morning, I got another ten thousand dollar matching grant to add after we've met the thirty. So, um, oh well, matching grant means that people will say, you know, if you can raise this amount of money, then I'll donate this. So anything, it, 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 anything you give tonight will be doubled. doubled. Yes, yes. So anything that if you were to donate anything, it gets doubled basically, unless it's above the limit of the match, and then it just helps out. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so that's, well, well, let me just see if there's, there's a little bit of questions. So, so that's basically what we're at, and, and it's been um, the first time in 50 years, really, that we have, as a culture, the opportunity to medicalize a psychedelic. And for people who are interested in, in the field of being a psychedelic therapist or being, um, in some ways, running a psychedelic clinic or being uh, psychedelic neuroscience, it's the first time in 50 years that people could, young people could say, I want a career in this area, and it could actually come true. Mm -hmm. So we're jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a jobs program. And it, and it deals with despair. And it deals with fear and pain. So, so that's where we're at. And that's, that's the moment that we're at now. So it's, it's a very delicate moment. And the, the position of the Trump administration on this research is unclear. Um, my, I spoke to my wife right before I, I came here, and she was just saying how the person who was appointed health, head of health and human services, which actually is over the FDA, that there was a commentary that the person who was of price, uh, the congressman, I think, um, the, the critique was that he doesn't believe in the H, the H, or the S. <laughs> so it, it is a challenge, but I think through this um, approach through the veterans, through the strategy, through the outreach to realestate.com and the outreach to Fox, it seems like there is um, an, a real opportunity to go through. So I think we need to seize the opportunity while we have it and move as quickly as we can into phase three, and that's what our plans are. And I'm going to seize this opportunity. Um, and we'll just take two questions. Um, Wait, can we pass the, the pledge form? But on before we take questions, I just wanted to let everyone know that we do have forms that you can fill out if you're interested in giving tonight. As we mentioned, all donations tonight will be matched two to one. Wow. Um, really? Thanks. 
generous grants. Um, unless you give too much. <laughs> unless you give too much. <laughs> and then we can talk about that when it happens. So I'll start passing these around. Natalie, would you mind helping us take questions? Twenty five thousand is still. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll take twenty five thousand is still. Does anyone have any questions? Um, <clears throat> have you considered a crowdfunding a campaign, and, and why? Uh, we we have done crowdfunding campaigns, and um, yes, um, we've done crowdfunding campaigns for Burning Man, for the Zendo project at Burning Man. We, we have um, raised money through crowdfunding even a little bit for, this, um, for the purchase of the MDMA. Yesterday, there was a fellow um, in Colombia, they've just had a peace treaty between the rebels and the, um, the government. And there's a, a man who's a Colombian in New York, and he's pioneered crowdfunding for um, small investors to buy parts of big buildings, opportunities that small investors didn't have before. But he was spiritualized through ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And so now he's, so I talked to him yesterday, he said he's gonna donate $100,000 towards preparing a crowdfunding campaign or helping us raise money for phase three. Cool. And he's also doing similar for the people that are trying to develop psilocybin into a medicine. So, and we're working on a study in Columbia. <coughs> yeah, yeah, he also, he wants to do a study, in, yeah, we are trying to do a Colombian study, but he also said he wants to do a study of how you can use MDMA to take people from different sides of a conflict and see if they can listen better to each other <laughs> and use it in conflict resolution. So if it's not a medical application, that just happened yesterday. Yeah, so I haven't told you. But, but I mean, that, that's, that, yes, this is your PhD. Yeah, so that's what he wants to fund. It is this kind of, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know that we need just two questions. Yeah. Or, also, our current campaign is a crowdfunding came, campaign, just for reference, and most of our work, work is this one, so we have an online component, and anyone Contributing today, that is physical crowdfunding. So, yeah. You're in crowd. So, uh, my question is about analogs yeah. that are yeah. now becoming more popularized. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, in general, the analogs are being um, produced largely because they're not illegal. They're not specifically illegal. And a lot of times, the analogs are more dangerous than the, than the drugs that they're supposed to be replacing. Um, so, for example, the synthetic cannabinoids. A lot of those were initially developed spice. It turns out that a member of our board of directors, who's no longer alive, was the one that started spice. Really? Yeah, Shauna. Oh. So, and he did it to undermine the drug war. And a lot of so, in so I think that a lot of times the analogs are more dangerous. But the main thing is that even if there was an analog that was better than MDMA, and Sasha Shogun, who developed. MDMA and developed hundreds and hundreds of other compounds said in um, the documentary about it. He said that of all the drugs that he's developed, MDMA does what MDMA does more than anything else. But we can't really, I don't think, make an analog into a medicine. And the reason is because we could not afford to do so. Because right now, with highly demonized drugs, with MDMA, with psilocybin, with marijuana, governments of the world have spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to show what's wrong with them. And so the risk profile of these drugs is enormous, and the data is in the public domain. So if you go right now to say um, Medline, the repository of the world scientific literature, and put in MDMA or ecstasy, there's over 5,000 papers. So we have had somebody on our staff. We probably spent $200,000, and we've captured $350 million worth of research. So we're not looking for analogs, but big pharma would, because the other part is MDMA is in the public domain. Treated PTSD is uh, use of MDMA. There's no use patent, so there's no patent protection or anything like that. So big pharma will look for um, analogs that they can develop one day that they can patent. And so, like you're just you're talking about trying to support stuff that other people won't support. For us, looking for new analogs is something that if, if big pharma wants to do it, and they are doing that now with marijuana. They're trying to figure out marijuana. Um, combinations of terpenes and different cannabinoids and non-smoking delivery systems and then they patent them. But is that what you're yes. kind of thinking? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, and, and so far we really, um, I haven't found an analog yet that, that does more, <coughs> but if any of you have experimented and have one, I'd be interested to know about it, but I don't think that we could actually, for personally it's, but I, I don't think we could actually medicalize it because it, it would be beyond our resources. 
Well, not much. Um, just, we said we were going to date, but we okay. can go longer. I don't mind, but I, I just been sitting for a long time. So I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I do love to say and keep asking questions. Okay. Uh,